God gives us a unique privilege of testing his promises. That's one of the reasons he sends afflictions. In fact, it's the sixth one, as you turn with me to Psalm 119. Right in the middle of your Bible, the 119th Psalm, Psalm 119, verse 107. And I trust this morning that we will realize the blessing of affliction is that we, through afflictions, get to test the promises of God. One of the ways we are assured of our salvation is that we get to test the promises of God here on earth. We get to see God fulfill what he promised to do. That's why blessing comes to us through affliction. We're looking at that sixth blessing. There are seven that are listed in the 119th Psalm. And this blessing shows us what affliction can do in our lives. The 107th verse tells us, I am afflicted very much. And then it continues with, Revive me, O Lord, according to your word. But that reviving according to his word comes in the context of being afflicted very much. The 107th verse is unique. In fact, I spent so long this week just looking at the immensity. I mean, if you just look at it, it looks like it's just like the same as all the other Five we've looked at, and there's one more next time. But let me just walk you through this verse. First, I'll read it for you with a little enhancement. I am afflicted. Remember, that's the word for uh, physical affliction. It means to bow you down. It it speaks of uh, physically pushing you down. So I am pushed down very much. Now, that's where we get into something interesting. That's the same word that's used to describe the flood and the plagues. Of Moses, the flood of Noah, and the plagues of Moses on Egypt. Now that should that should tell you how afflicted the psalmist feels, Ezra, in his life. He says, "I am afflicted very much, uh, like the waters of the flood and the plagues that struck Egypt." Revive me, O Lord, according to your word. Now that word, revive me, is exactly the same word that God uses to describe His rescue of Rahab. Now, I can't help but go back to my childhood. Any of you that are old enough to remember the old cat and mouse cartoons, I think they were silent when I was little. Maybe they had music, but, you know, they were just moving characters. But that little mouse would run around, it would hide, and the cat would do something, and the whole house would collapse, and there would be the mouse standing all alone. That's what I see in my mind when I think of Rahab. I think of Rahab in her little wall house, and the whole city goes, and there's Rahab standing like this going, how Did I survive this and realize the true and living God? And what the psalmist is saying here is, I am saved through my great flooded and plagues of afflictions by the Lord. He's revived me. He has saved me. He has kept me alive. And how does he do that? The end of the 107th verse, according to your word. Remember when we looked at all 10 of these words, this word means his voice. So what he's saying is, God, you have talked me through the complete flood of problems, the complete disaster that has totally made my whole world crumble around me, and I'm standing here, and because I hear your voice through your word, I'm surviving. Now that's testing the promises of God. Let's look at it briefly this morning. Back up with me to Genesis chapter 7. I want to give you a little... Uh, exposition. You know, someone said to me once, they said, you don't, you're not an expositor of the word. I said, no, I'm sorry. I said, you're talking about textual preaching. A textual preacher never leaves the text he's in. An expositor goes to the whole Bible to look at the verses he's looking at. So let me expound the 107th verse. It says in Genesis chapter 7 and verse 18, it uses the same word for very much. I'm afflicted very much. It's an adverb. It's the same Hebrew word that's used for the waters of the flood covering the earth. In Genesis 7:18, it says the waters prevailed and greatly increased on the earth. There's that word. Now, now think about what it was like for the poor earth. The poor earth was there and all of a sudden this overwhelming flood of water came upon it. That's the picture. The divine engineer, the Holy Spirit of God, wanted to capture by the word he inspired his servant, Ezra, to record that that greatly increased. That is that word. Now keep going to verse 19. And the waters prevailed, and here is the word repeated again, exceedingly on the earth. 
and all the high hills under the whole heaven were covered. We're looking at what, what kind of trouble was Ezra going through when he wrote these words in Psalm 119, 107. He was going through big time troubles. Now, let me ask you, do you feel sometime in life that your troubles are raining down on your life like the floodwaters on the earth during the time of Noah? Do you feel like troubles are just coming down, they're piling up, and they're just going to drown you? Well, then you're, you're right in the right territory for this blessing of this verse. Do you feel drowned by your pain and problems? Then affliction can force you to test the promises of the Lord. He wants to revive you by you learning to listen to his voice in his word. Now you say, I'm really struggling. It's really hard for me to to get in the Bible. You wouldn't believe. How did Ezra do it? Do you know how hard it was for him to get in the word? The word for him was like, like you you get a roll of, of paper towel about this big around and start unrolling it. That's how long the Bible was. We're talking about Isaiah was 55 feet long. How would you like to do a little Bible study in Isaiah and have to roll out a 55 foot long scroll? And there was only one of them for the whole community. Can you imagine how hard it was? And yet these people would sit and would would inculcate and memorize the word of God into their hearts and they would meditate on it. You think you have trouble? I I have so many copies of the Word of God. I have it on endless websites. You can have it on your computer. You can have it on your PDA. You can carry around an old-fashioned book like this, which I carry with me everywhere. You can have verse cards in your pocket. It's not you don't have time. You don't want to. That's the problem. We have a problem with our wanters, not with the Word. Well, he wanted it. Well... Affliction should force us to test the promises of the Lord. He wants to revive us. He wants us listening to his voice and his word. Then he guides us, leads us, rescues us from the rising floodwaters of our problems and comforts us. Well, keep going to the next book, Exodus chapter 9, because the same word is used throughout. And we could uh, get an awful lot of examples of this, but it's another beautiful picture. And you say... You know, I was sharing this with someone. They says, oh, how, how, do you, how do you make those things, you know, in the Bible? I said, I didn't make them. I'm just pointing them out. The Lord supernaturally engineered every person that wrote uh, his word and every person in place and event that's named. And the Lord God made that tie together like a fabric so that these men who never saw each other that wrote this book over a 1,400 year period of time, they made it fit together better than the Herodian masonry of of Jerusalem where they've got 60-ton stones you can't even stick a a credit card between. I mean, that's how tightly the Bible fits together. Let me show you another one. Exodus 9 and verse 3. And behold, right in the middle of the plagues on Egypt, the hand of the Lord will be on your cattle and on the field and the horses and the donkeys and the camels and the oxen and on the sheep. Verse 3 of Exodus 9. A very severe pestilence. There's the same idea where the psalmist said, I'm afflicted very much. It's the very same word. It it describes the absolute horrible plague that came down. Now keep going to verse 18. Moses continues, behold, tomorrow, Exodus 9, 18. About this time, I will cause a very heavy hail to rain down. The Lord is is, uh, speaking about what he's going to do to Egypt through Moses. Such as not has been in Egypt since his founding until now. But look at that 18th verse. I will cause a very heavy hail. Do you see the intensity? I mean, we're not talking about just having, you know, a little, a little uh, you know, fogginess in the morning before you have your coffee. We're talking about major events here. Go to chapter 10 and verse 14. And the locusts, Exodus 10, 14, went up over all the land of Egypt and rested on all the territory of Egypt. They were very severe. Previously, there'd never been such locusts as they, nor shall there be after them. Okay, do you get the idea? The, the Lord, uh, there are many ways he could have said through Ezra in Psalm 119 that I'm having trouble. He takes the, the zenith word. I mean, he takes, he takes the, the top level for, for problems. I mean, we're talking about mega, you know, I don't know what the codes are with our terrorist alert, but boy, it was the top one, you know. We're talking about he's really struggling. Now, think about this. Are your life's pains 
sometimes like the plagues of Egypt. Another one coming, and you haven't even recovered from the last one. That's what the plagues were like. And they were big. And all of them were totally decimating and totally just destructive to the land. And the Lord says, when your afflictions come, like the plagues of Egypt, when they're just, you don't even have time to recover. I mean, they, the, the crops are wiped out, and now the animals are wiped out, and now the, the next year's crops are getting wiped out by these locusts, which are eating, you know, the buds off the trees. And there is just like it's hopeless. Then affliction can force you if you're in that situation, to test the promises of the Lord who wants to revive you by listening to the Lord's voice and his word, by guiding you into that place where he wants you to be, and where he wants me to be, by leading us, rescuing us, and comforting us. See, that's why afflictions come. They come so that as they're raining down on us like the flood, and as they're just coming in wave after wave like the plagues of Egypt, we will stop And look up and say, God, you promised that you would revive me in the midst of my affliction. And I am counting on it now. And we test his promises and he he fulfills it. Well, now keep your finger. uh, Let's go to Joshua chapter uh, 2. Okay, so keep going to the right to Joshua 2. And keep your finger there. Deuteronomy, Joshua chapter 2. And go back, because I don't want you to forget what we're talking about. Go back to Psalm 119, but keep your finger in Joshua 2, okay? Because I want you to see this, uh, the beauty of this, in the, in the context of what he's saying. Joshua, we're going to go back to it, but look at Psalm 119, verse 107. He says this, I personally, not the nation Israel, not my friends, me, I am afflicted, that's physically The picture is just keep stacking stuff. Um, I remember the first time I took a tour group to Egypt, I saw a lady carrying a refrigerator on her head and shoulders. I mean, she had that thing like this, and she was walking along with a refrigerator. A woman. The men don't do that kind of work over there. It's the ladies. And she was walking along, staggering with her refrigerator. And I thought for sure she was going to, you know, can you imagine what that would do? You know, just break something, crush your ribs and everything else. And, and I thought about that when I read this word afflicted because that is exactly the picture. It is bowed down and squashed under something so heavy. So 107 says, I'm staggering along through life, crushed down very much. Now, when you read that very much again, think of two things. Think of the flood. That was a very much event. And think of the plagues of Egypt. That was a very much event, Okay. Now, now look what it says. This is what God promises he'll do for you and for me. If we'll test his promises when we're going through affliction, here's the blessing. Revive me, O Lord, not by taking away the problem, not by, by never letting me have another problem in my life, not by, uh, you know, just, just having me live one of these, uh, you know, life with this free of any problem. No, no, no. Revive me. How? Verse 107 says, According to your word. See, that's why we have to know the Bible. We have to know the promises of God so that we know when he is doing this reviving. Let me show you what reviving is now. Back up to where your finger is in Joshua 2. Because the word in Psalm 119, 107 for revive is not speaking of a, a little country church with uh, you know lots of music and a, and a long invitation or something like that, which we think of as an old-fashioned, I'm a southern preacher and I've preached in revivals all over the south, and I know what we think of as revival. It's not talking about that. Look, look what it's talking about. It's a personal event. The word for revive is actually the word save my life. It's the same Hebrew word that's used for the rescue of Rahab from Jericho while the walls crumbled around her and everyone else was destroyed as she alone was rescued. Now, now that is a picture, if you can see it in your mind. Look at chapter 2, verse 13. That you will spare the lives. There's that word revive. That's actually the same Hebrew word. Remember I told you the fascinating thing of the Bible is that there are... 8,000 different words in the Bible that are translated by only 6,000 English words. So there is a huge amount of learning because the English translators did not have time to exhaust the full meaning. That's why we have so many versions of the Bible. I got 
many notes on this. Why are there so many versions? The reason we have so many versions is that God inspired uh, this, this underlying body of revelation, and we're trying to get it into the English language. Now, every Bible version, every major Bible version does it, but the beauty comes when you spend time to look at what the Hebrew words that are underlying the English words are. And here's one I'm doing for you. I'm giving you an example. This Hebrew word for revive is exactly the same in Psalm 119, 107, but look how Joshua 2 translates it, that you will spare the lives. Now, now that's what the word means. Spare the lives of my father, my mother, my brothers and sisters, and all who belong to them, that you will save us from death. Now, the save us from death is a different word than spare the lives. So, so there's such beauty in the Hebrew language, but we're looking at spare the lives. Now, look at chapter 6. Keep going in Joshua to chapter 6. Same word. We're doing a little word study on the word revive. Verse 17 of chapter 6. Now, the city shall be doomed by the Lord to destruction. It... And all who are in it, only Rahab the harlot, and here's the same word from Psalm 119, 107, shall live. She and all who are with her in her house, because she hid the messengers that were sent. Now drop down to verse 25. Very same word again. And Joshua spared. Now, now isn't this fascinating? Verse 17, shall live. Verse 25, spared. Verse 13 of chapter 2, spare the lives. Do you get the idea of what it's talking about? The context is that this was the great city of Canaan. This was the the gateway city. When you crossed the Jordan River, you came up on this looming fortress that was uh, impenetrable walls. It was just just perfectly defensible, this, this gigantic fortress, Jericho. Ancient city, one of the oldest continuously inhabited cities in the world. Here's this monster city sitting up here, and one unrighteous woman comes to faith in the true and living God and believes what he says and gets this scarlet cord, and we could go through the whole ramifications of the scarlet cord that was stuck out of her window and the scarlet cord of redemption. But here she is perched in one of the worst places to be in the city, the wall. Her home seemingly, because of her profession, was right there by the gate so she could attract the travelers into her wickedness and her harlotry. And so there she was in the most dangerous place to be, on the wall, especially if it's being attacked by an enemy army. And right there on the wall, she's standing and she sees the nation of Israel come and they march around. Remember the whole deal? Silently walking and then seven times they go around. And kaboom, the Bible says that the walls fell outward. And there is one little sliver where Rahab and her family was. Now, now, look at verse 25. And Joshua revived Rahab the harlot. <laughs> he spared her as everything around her crumbled, and her father's household and all that she had. And she dwells in Israel to this day because she hid the messengers, verse 25 says, whom Joshua sent to spy out. Now, here's the question for us. Do you ever feel like you're not going to survive what you're going through right now? I mean, the pain, the hurt, and everything is crumbling, everything that you've held on to in life, and it's just crumbling away. Well, if that's how you feel, then you feel like Rahab did when the city of Jericho was destroyed. And God rescued her, God spared her, God revived her, as Psalm 119 uses the same word. And that is what God does when he allows afflictions into our life. Did you know that the destruction of of Jericho was an affliction that Rahab had to go through? She would not be the hero in the lineage of Jesus Christ without that event. She would not be one who the Bible records was still living in Israel and and in that time and, and one who was accepted into that community without that event. You know, it would have been nice to not have to have gone through that. But look what it did for her. She tested the promises of God. I mean, what if she just said, wait a minute, I'm going to get one of those quick escape ladders, and when they come, I'm going to run down and run through and, and you know, get with the army of Israel so they, nothing happens. No. God says, I want you to stay put. I want you to park. I am going to revive you when your whole world crumbles and falls apart and everything around you is destroyed. I'm going to spare you. She got to test the promises of God. Afflictions can force you and me to test the promises of the Lord 
God wants to revive us. He wants us to hear his voice in his word. He wants to guide us. He wants to lead us. He wants to rescue us. He wants to comfort us. Well, back to Psalm 119, right back in the middle of your Bible. And look again at verse 107. Afflictions allow us to experientially test the promises of God. Now, notice what, if you've been marking these in your Bible, we started way over in verse 50. Now, if you're a good, obedient class member here, you've got something in verse 50 marked, probably the word affliction. And then skip over to verse 67. It's there again. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. And then down in verse 71, it's good for me I've been afflicted. In verse 75, in faithfulness you've afflicted me. And in verse 92, unless your law had been my delight, I would have perished in my affliction. But now, look at verse 107. You can almost catch the feeling of what's going through the psalmist's mind. He says this. He says, I have been afflicted, 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 and I am, look at verse 107, I am afflicted very much. It's not going away. You could almost look at the 119th Psalm as a kind of a, a long version of the life of Ezra. And it's like we're afflicted and we're afflicted and we're afflicted and we're afflicted and we're afflicted and, we're afflicted and now we're still being afflicted and it's not over. Now, let me tell you a little something. That's what life is like. You know, some of the hardest days in life are the last days. When you're young, you always have something to look forward to. When you're young, you always have at least strength or good looks or future or time or something. You always have something. But when you get older, everything is running out. Your time, your strength, your energy, your hope, at least in this perspective, the horizontal hope. And that's what he's going through. He says, <laughs> I'm afflicted very much. Affliction usually increases as we get older, but God's word always renews, always refresh, always revives. Often we know so much more than we experience, and so affliction is a reality check. And affliction seem to grow through life more and more. But after disasters, people really listen. And that's what we see going on. He says, I, in verse 107, am afflicted very much. And I know you're going to spare me because I'm listening to your voice and your word. Well, now I want to go to where we're going to close, and that's Hebrews chapter 11. Okay, so go all the way to the end of your Bible, near the end, Hebrews 11. Let me introduce it this way. Affliction is a blessing. Trials refine us. Pains will open our eyes to the realities of life. Sorrow tunes us in to what really matters in life. And on and on through life it goes. Traumatic and painful experiences actually help us to be more aware and a part of what God is doing. And to illustrate this, Hebrews 11, verses 8 through 19. And with that introduction about how, how difficult life is, let me read you about a really hard life. In fact, Bonnie so sweetly always is is uh, asking me what I'm learning in the Bible and, and uh, asking me to share a little bit. She says, what are you learning this week? This was about Wednesday. I said, honey, I have spent all week with Abraham. And let me show you what I mean. Hebrews 11, starting in verse 8. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out, listen, not knowing where he was going. (laughs) Don't let that go by you. Think about leaving on a big trip with a huge family and traveling all told 1,500 miles and not even know where you're going. How do you know when you get there? How do you know when to stop? I mean, just think about it. This is immense. Verse 9, by faith, he dwelt in the land of promises in a foreign country, dwelling in tents. That doesn't mean anything unless you realize he left the most civilized city of the ancient world that had multi-story buildings that were plastered on the inside. They had indoor plumbing. I mean, this guy was in the, the ultimate place to live, and he moved to a tent. And he lived, after God called him, 100 years in a tent. Wow. Dwelling in tents. With Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. And he waited for a city which had foundations, whose builder and maker is God. By faith, Sarah herself also received strength, conceived seed, and she bore a child when she was past the age, because she judged him faithful, who had promised. She tested the promises of God, just like her husband did. 
Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead. <laughs> How do you like? That's the way some women do think of their husbands. He's as good as dead. You know, I mean, not much there, not much life. Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead was born as many as the stars of the sky in multitude, innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. These all died in faith. Look at this. Not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, they were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Abraham never built anything but altars. Seven of them at least. He could have, he was wealthy enough, he had thousands that were with him. I mean, just his, his male armed with sword servants were 318. He had 318 in his army. Can you imagine how many other children and servants? He, he had an entourage that numbered in the thousands. If anybody could build a house, he could have built a house. He didn't ever build a house. He stayed in tents because he wanted to confess by his lifestyle that he was a stranger at the end of verse 13 and pilgrim. Verse 14, for they that say such things declare plainly by their lifestyle that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come, they would have had opportunity to return. He could have gone back to his nice house, the Riverside house over in Ur. But now they desire a better, that is a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed. To be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, whom he had received the promise, offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, In Isaac your seed shall be called. Verse 19, concluding that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from which also he received him in a figurative sense. Let me just show you just a few things from this scripture. Verse 8, if Abraham was able to tell us what he was thinking about, I think in verse 8 he would have said this, where's the promised place we're going? If I'm going to leave with my wife and my my servant load and and all of these animals uh, that I've got to carry around with me and feed and birth and calve and shear and, you know, pull the thorns out, where are we going? But look what he says in verse 8. He went out not knowing where he was going. He didn't know where, but he went. Verse 12, this man is good as dead. How is this promised son possible? I'm too old, he would have said. I can't have children. I'm beyond all this. How is this possible? So where wasn't answered. How wasn't answered. Verse 13, it says, not having received the promises. When? When? I mean, if you think about it, every possible question is asked. Where are we going? How are we going to get there? And when is this going to happen? And then the last one. Look at, look at verse 17. When he was tested, he offered up Isaac. Why do you want me to do that? I mean, every. How, when, what, and why? God, I don't understand anything that's going on. That was an affliction. His life was a hundred years of affliction, a hundred years of waiting, a hundred years of what and how and why and when. And yet, look what God does with that. Think with me real quickly. Where is the promised place, verse 8, not knowing where there's going? Sometimes we think about heaven that way, right? Is it worth so much to sacrifice here and now? Do I really need to be a pilgrim and stranger on this planet? Do I need my lifestyle to reflect where I'm going? Do I need my lifestyle to reflect who I worship and who I believe? You know, it's not very easy to build an altar when you live in a tent. You can't build it inside. It has to be. And you know what an altar is? It's an outside monument to what you believe in the sight of the community. And he was making markers. Now, I'm not saying go out and pile rocks in your backyard and when your neighbors ask you what you're doing, you tell them. No, no. This, this was in his context, in his culture. It was an external, visible display of an event in his life where he met with God. And he made that, and he would return to those. He would restore them. He'd rebuild them. He'd reconsecrate them because he never wanted to forget what God had done in his life. Now, when we face questions like, like 
Abraham went through. It's time to test the promises of God and find out he's more than enough for what we need. When we say, Lord, I don't know where I'm going. I don't know what's going on in life. I don't know why all this is happening. I don't know why I'm flooded like Noah's flood. I don't know why that my life is like the plagues of Moses sometime. I don't know why my whole world's crumbling like Rahab. Then it's time to look up and say, God, I test your promises. Will you show me? Will you lead me? Will you guide me your way? Verse 12, from this man and him as good as dead, how is this promised son possible? Sometimes we face obstacles that seem as impossible as a woman who never had children bearing a son at this ripe old age of 90 with a 100-year-old husband. What do you and I know that God has called us to do that sometimes seems impossible to accomplish? That's when we can test the promises of God. That's what Abraham did. He said, this is humanly impossible. And God says, I want to do something that you can't figure and plan and orchestrate and work out so that when I do it, I'll get all the credit. You see the idea. That's what these impossible situations are. In America, we don't even go into a war until we've already declared we're going to win it. That's just the way things are. I mean, we have to have overwhelming firepower and superior everything and and have all these, you know, drones around and these see-through-the-dark things and everything else. And we won't even... We won't even Enter it until we know that the outcome is assured. And God says, you're going to enter this situation in life not knowing humanly and trusting the outcome to me. And see, that's what the life of faith is about. And verse 13, when was this going to happen? This is probably the hardest one for us. We really struggle with waiting. Abraham, I mean, between two verses will be 10, 15 years. They just go by. Like that. I mean, 10, 15 years? I mean, most people have trouble. They, they send a, you know, an email, and if it's two seconds, they're, what's wrong with that? You know, and the cell phone. I mean, we can't wait seconds. Wait one minute at a stoplight. You'll have people getting out of their car, kicking your car, you know, yelling at you. I had a man just, Oh, he got so angry at me, and I couldn't even figure out. The guy behind me is the one that honked. I don't honk at people. I didn't do anything. He just, I thought he was going to hit my, that would have been okay. The back bumper fell off. He'd have knocked the front one off, you know. But people are just so impatient. And Abraham, he had to say, when was this going to happen? He trusted God. And finally, verse 17, the ultimate thing, he finally got the answer, the son. And God says, kill him. And we say, why does God want this? I've, I have prepared. It reminds me of one of our dear saints who had his whole Christian adult life, wanted to go to Bible school and be a missionary. And just in the last few months before he was supposed to retire and everything was going along great, he had a life-threatening illness, and he was laying in that bed. And his wife was standing there, and we thought for sure he was going to die. And I remember everyone saying, why would God do this? I mean, if anybody should be able to make it, Prince Platner should have made it to the mission field. And there he was, almost dead. I mean, he was about as close to dead as I've seen anybody and come back. And you know what? God just wanted to put him through that affliction with his wife and all of us, his friends, for us to say what Abraham said. Why? Well, let's end back where we were. Psalm 119, 107. I'm going to close out. Let me tie this together. God wants you and me, in verse 107, listen, and and I hope this, this verse will come alive in your life. When you go through life and you have had affliction and you've done well, and affliction and you've done well, and affliction and you've done well, and troubles and God has brought you through, all that, then you get to the point of 107 and you say, I am afflicted very much. I am drowning. It's wave after wave coming in my life, and I don't think I'm going to survive then this is what God says in verse 107. I will rescue you and I will keep you alive like Rahab, the only one that survived Jericho. Rahab and her family. I will do that so that, verse 107, so that I can allow you to hear my voice in my word. Now, Wouldn't you like to test the promises of God and know he's really out there? Yes. And even if you don't want to, he's going to let you, okay? And when he does that, 
And when he floods you and when he storms you and when he sends the plagues like Moses across Egypt, what he wants you to do is to test his promises, to hear his voice and say, Lo, you're with me always. No good thing will you withhold from me. You said if I stay with you that I will walk in your presence and you'll bring everything. And so I believe you, God. That's the response he wants from you and me when we're afflicted very much. Let's bow before the Lord and thank him that he is so wise and wants to do all this in our lives. Father in heaven, I thank you that even when we're afflicted very much, you'll rescue us. You will keep us alive. You will save us in our troubles. That you will come to where we are. You actually deliver us. We know what a delivery is. It's when someone brings us what we need right there where we are. And that's what you want. You want to rescue us. You want to revive us. You want to save us right where we are so that we can test your promises. This week, we're all facing different things in our lives. But when we feel like we're drowning, when it feels like a wave is coming and we haven't recovered from the last wave, that's when you want us to hear your still, small voice through your word. And we want to test your promises as we hear your voice and say, Are you really there, God? Are you really who you have always said? Can I really trust my life? And you'll say yes as you rescue us in the midst of our problems. You don't take them away, but you come And you deliver us right where we are. Thank you for that truth. And for those who have never received a a membership in such a wonderful, wonderful relationship, that membership is being born into your family. And I pray that anyone today who has never been born into the family of God would realize as the first message your great apostle ever gave in his personal soul winning, he said to that seeking heart, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. That's what we believe, that's what we proclaim, and that's what we experience. We thank you for it. In the name of Jesus, we ask. Amen.